Montag, um, to you and Cass and everyone at, uh, at By Their Words. Thanks to Allison, all the other readers. Thanks to all of you. Uh, so a book of stories came out last fall. Um, it's over there on the table. I'm going to read four really short um, pieces from it. The first one is called Plan A, Plan B. Plan A, Plan B. I went to school to be a grackle, you know, but nobody was hiring, and I got a gig part-time as a paperweight. It's all right. You just push down, that's the key. Push down. Sometimes, though, through the windows, I see them out there in the swoop and the wheel of it, and for a couple of minutes, it's a little hard to breathe. Like, what if I just let the papers go? Just to see what the wind does with them. To watch each sheet lift off and turn. It's called the squirrels. She can no longer locate her words. They aren't where she left them. She hesitates, she points, she makes a sound. The squirrels, she begins, then stops. She looks around the room. She doesn't mean squirrels. My fire pan is growing, she says by way of explanation. Her husband is pale, furious, making arrangements. The tumors in her brain are getting larger. He opens and closes his hands. Her eyes are unnaturally clear, luminous almost. See those eyes, the nurse says to the social worker on the steps outside, and the social worker sighs, nods, licks her lips. The overheaded room smells like urine and orchids, the flowers and large arrangements on the dresser, on the windowsill, on the floor. The nurse and the social worker go down the steps to the sidewalk, chat about other things for a bit before heading for their cars. Holly is coming tomorrow, the husband says, touching her shoulder. Our feather, she says. Our hollow, she says, after a while. He sits on the edge of the bed, stands again. Her hand, her right hand, is contracted so severely that she shouts with pain when it's touched. The nails were left untrimmed for many weeks, and they grew into the palm, cut through, and the wounds in the palm infected. I didn't know, the husband tells the daughter on the phone, his voice choking, and the daughter weeps because of her mother's illness and her father's bewilderment and her own crashing sense of the merciless world. She packs blindly, not folding the clothes. I want, the mother says. She brings her head forward off the pillow. Where's that tower? Some days are better than others, though. I'm calmer than I thought I'd be, she'd said once, just a few mornings ago. Holly arrives, red-eyed. She wraps her arms around her trembling father. I'm here now, Dad, she tells him. She is aware of how frail he is, of the tension in his thin frame. The three of them are together on the bed. The nurse with the gentle voice stops by to say goodnight. She presses the husband's hand, takes a long look at the daughter. Is there anything else I can get you, she asks. And the daughter shakes her head. We're just fine, she says brightly and blushes, her cheeks filling with blood. The nurse starts to say something else, stops. The daughter swallows. She says, we're just fine, again. Her face is burning. The father opens and closes his hands. The door shuts with a click. The lights are dimmer now, only a lamp on the dresser. Painted flowers on the lampshade, real flowers all around. The bulb shines steadily, without flickering. The door, the mother mumbles once. The grass. They give her ice chips, sit next to the bed. Her breathing is still strong. I didn't walk that far, she says. No more traffic outside. The three of them are together. Put my hat on.
It's called sobriety. Sobriety. Say there's a game. You're walking by yourself on a dirt road through a forest at sundown. And all you have to do is keep walking. Nothing to it. One foot, then the other foot, then the other foot, forever. And the only thing you aren't allowed to do, even when the sun slips down behind the hills, even when the darkness thickens all around you, even when the devil starts his moaning in the trees, the only thing you aren't allowed to do is run. This is the last one. It's called the donkey at the gates of the kingdom of heaven. Once a donkey ascended to the shining gates of the kingdom of heaven, the gates were open. The donkey heard music more beautiful than anything she had ever imagined. Each note was a star going supernova, a pack of wolves running down an elk over snow. The song poured itself into the world. The donkey stood transfixed. Without thinking, she opened her mouth wide and brave. Instantly, the music stopped. Total silence. Her bray had been off-key, awful, a donkey's sound. Slowly, the gates of the kingdom of heaven began to swing shut. The donkey didn't know what to do, whether she should advance or retreat. The light was blinding. She took one trembling step forward, then another. She couldn't see a thing. The donkey brayed again, knowing it would not be beautiful. She was right. It wasn't beautiful. It was her same old donkey bray. She did it again and again. She couldn't tell if the gates were open now or closed, or even where they were exactly. She shut her eyes and thought about the entirety of her life. She remembered eating hay, carrying firewood. She brayed again. She did. She let it rip. She kept her eyes closed and staggered forward, belting it out. Carrier of firewood, eater of hay. She took her whole life's only song and she employed it, step after step into brightness, into terrible, dazzling light. Thank you.